The Apostle Paul is on his um, third missionary journey at this time where we've left him here in Acts. And um, while in Ephesus, we talked about this last week, we'll just kind of re- re- recover the ground just a little bit. He's over in Ephesus. Um, he, he, he has apparently written a letter to the church at Corinth and sent uh, uh, Timothy over to um, visit and see what's going on. And um, a letter has been brought back to them, and then people come from Corinth with news of how the church is doing, and it ain't good. There's a lot of junk going on over at Corinth. And, you know, it's a city that is, is given to idolatry. It's a sin that's given to the, st- it's a city given to the flesh. It's just, a, it's just not a great uh, atmosphere, okay, going on over there. It's, it is, it is what it is. It's a carnal city. Um, they, they, they worship the, um, um, their goddess, which is the, akin to Diana of the Ephesians. It's the same goddess. It's just a different name. And um, which was the, the goddess of fertility and, and uh, of, of, of um, yeah, fertility or love, of love. Huh? Which one? Uh, that one would work. That's fine. There's, there was another one. That one would work. Thank you. Okay. So the Apostle Paul's over here in Ephesus. This is a little easier. He's right there. And uh, he's been, he spends about two years there. And, um, and so he's got all these issues going on there. He's written, and you know, we find out, we said last week, that uh, there appears to be a letter he wrote that is lost because he refers to that letter um, in uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, let me see here. I believe the lost letter was in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verse 5. We'll, we'll get that tonight. That's right. We will get to it tonight. Um, but he wrote them. He says, I wrote to you in an epistle. So and this is 1 Corinthians. He's already said, I wrote to you in an epistle. So he wrote them a letter, apparently, dealing with some stuff, the word has come back to him. They didn't receive it real well. They did not they actually receive his letter real well, kept carrying on some things. And so uh, before he leaves Ephesus for his next part of his mission journey, he writes what we refer to as uh, 1 Corinthians. And this letter is, is probably the most corrective letter of the New Testament. Paul deals with a lot of stuff in this letter. Then he deals with stuff that they, in a letter, had sent to him. He addresses some issues later on in this letter. But this is a very corrective letter um, to straighten out things going on in the church and wanted to get some things uh, uh, clarified. And, 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 and we got through chapter 4 last week. And um, we were about, about to start in chapter 5. And uh, chapter 5, I'm going to tell you something. If you think that doing whatever you want to do in the church is okay, uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It, it, Paul brings a stern rebuke to what's going on in the church. People say, I'm under grace, it doesn't matter what I do. Uh, on the other side, they'll say, listen, for you, you know, we just have to love people who are living in sin. And that is not what Paul, you know, listen, I understand, that, but I understand that love, you know, we are to love people, but we're to love them biblically and not emotionally. Because emotional love, a lot of times, it becomes a, a hindered uh, response to things. Now, uh, let's read this. We'll, we'll discuss some more things. So we're, we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If you have not been with us past couple of Wednesday nights or, or any of them, I encourage you to go back to the website and listen to the videos or watch the videos. The PowerPoint that we're using is on the website. So if you want to listen to the services or watch the services and have the PowerPoint there with you, with, with you, with you, you're at your, you can do that. You can watch the PowerPoint. I mean, and, and go through the PowerPoint as we're going through the service while you're watching the service. So uh, you have that, that ability. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul now deals with, um, basically, he, he brings discipline to the church. All right? It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, this boy was living with his stepmama. His dad obviously been married, and him and, him and stepmama had the hots for each other. We had cougars before cougar was in. All right? We got television shows about cougars. Well, you had a cougar right here in the church of Corneth. All right? Now, remember, this is a city that is given to the flesh that is carnal. I mean, Paul said there's divisions among you. Remember that in, earlier in the uh, re- writing here in chapter 2 or 3? He says there's, car- there's envies among you. You're saying you're Paul and you're Paulus and you're Peter. And uh, <clears throat> they, they're just carnal. And here's, here's the thing. He says that this, this type of fornication um, that isn't even named among the Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't even practice this kind of stuff. 
And you got it in the church. You got it going on in the church. And see, people come to you and say, you know, well, Pastor Ray, you, you can't deal with sin like that. We got to love these people. Well, apparently, Paul did deal with it in the church, in church discipline. We've got to stop thinking that love is a mamby-pamby watered down, I love you and I'm not going to address you doing whatever you're doing. Now, the new mantra in the church. Now, how many remember years ago when ministers, ministers would preach something a little controversial? They would stand up and say, touch not God's anointed, and then preach their controversial message and insulate themselves from any criticism or, or critique of what they were preaching. Everybody, well, I can't say anything because he, he's the anointed of God. Really taken out of context, okay? Uh, David said that in regards to killing Paul, I mean, uh, uh, Saul, King Saul. But see, they, people, ministers started using it as an ins insulatory method to keep people from being able to question anything they were preaching. Well, that's not, we can't do that. Well, I mean, as a matter of fact, people are supposed to study the Bible. Out. They're supposed to prove it out. They're supposed to find out for themselves. They're not, you just don't, can't take my word for it or any minister's word for it. You have to find out for yourself. And it can't be faith to you if I just tell it to you. And you, and you go, okay, he said it, it has to be. That doesn't make it so. Right? Your faith comes from the word and not from the man. Amen? And so now the new, new insulatory thing people are using is, uh, you can't judge me. Judge not lest you be judged. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 1, that's, and now people are living in sin, and if you say anything about it, you're judging them. Now they're insulating themselves from critique or criticism of their actions. That's unbiblical. And, I gotta, and I'm going to teach on judgment sometime in the next, this quarter, um, in the next month, you know, in the next three months, I'm going to be teaching on judgment because we need to have a real understanding of biblical judgment. And, you know, and, and, and how what Jesus meant when he said judge not lest you be judged. Okay, and, and throughout the Bible in the New Testament where it talks about judging and, 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 and so forth. Even Paul says it in this, verse, this chapter. He talks about judgment. So we can't give in to insulatory statements which are really manipulative statements. Okay? You can't touch me. I'm the anointed of God. Now I've manipulated into you into having to accept whatever I say and you can't question it. That is manipulation. Okay? All right, I'm living in sin, and for you to say anything about it, you're judging me. Judge not, lest you be judged. Now, you've insulated yourself. I can't even say that, you know, you're out uh, having fornication with people and getting high on dope or whatever. I can't say anything about it because that's judgment, see? And that's not biblical. Do you understand? And so uh, we have to have an understanding of that, and kids can't take a little verse out of its context and run off and use it as our whatever. It's just, it's just what people do to insulate themselves from criticism particularly when they know they're doing wrong all right so it's commonly reported among you that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the gentiles that one should have his father's wife and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that ye have done this deed might that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you now um I was reading out of um, uh, Philip's translation, and he's, he's a little bit different in how he states this, and Weymouth's translation, they both kind of say this a little bit differently, but I'll tell you, uh, and I want to say differently, clearer. Basically, they decided not to do anything about it. Now, here comes Brother Jim with Daddy's mama, and they're fornicating and staying in the church, and there ain't nobody doing anything about it. Sitting in the church. And Paul said, because you're, you're puffed up about not doing anything about it. He says, verse 3, for verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already. There's that word that you can't use. As though I were present concerning him that has done this thing. I've judged this guy. <clears throat> I'm not even there and I've made a judgment. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver, whoa, he did not say love on him. He said to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh 
that the Spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Now that's love. How could that be love? You're supposed to just wrap your arms and say, I understand, it's okay to do what you're doing. God, God understands you've got flesh. Paul said, I'm turning them over to the devil to destroy his flesh so he don't go to hell. That is love. No, see, we, we live in a society that nobody can handle, I'm wrong. We, we don't put, I mean, listen, I'm not joking. In school systems now, they're, they're told not to put red X's on the students' papers because it makes them feel bad about themselves. You can't fail them anymore. They get gold stars if they put 2 plus 2 equals 67 because it makes them feel better about themselves. Everything's about how you feel. And there's no consequences for being wrong. Okay? Uh, in community colleges, you can't fail people anymore. All right? They're not, they don't fail. They have to retake. You failed. They're doing, they're doing pass or retake. They're not doing pass or fail. Because it, it hurts their image. Well, I mean, we're, we're crazy. And see, that spirit's operating in the church. Okay? Paul said, I will deliver him to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Listen to what he goes on and says here. He says, your glorying is not good. Talking about the fact that they're, they're oh, we're going on with the Lord, whatever, you know. Uh, and they, apparently, uh, Timothy told him something about how they were conducting themselves and how they responded to his letter um, because... He said, he said, you're glorying. He says, know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Do you not understand that church discipline is required when people are living in sin to protect the whole body? But see, people get mad at the pastor for dealing with stuff because he's not walking in love. We're leaving. He's not walking in love. I'm protecting the flock. Why? Because if you let that sin go on in the church through a person who's called a brother, you're going to leaven the whole lump of the body in that place. Amen. And so I have a responsibility, whether I preach about it or if, if the kid gets bad enough, go in there and pull them on the carpet and say, straighten up or you're out the door. You're not walking in lap. You're supposed to love them. I am loving them. I don't want them to go to hell. I'd rather be ticked at me right now and not go to hell later. Amen? Amen? They'll get over and be a tick to me eventually. <laughs> Amen. All right. This is what he says. Verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, for as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleaven. Bread of sincerity and truth. Now, what uh, Wayman says is, kick out the dude. Kick him out. Kick him out. That's the leaven. He's the leaven. Openly living this way is leaven, okay, in the church body. Um, verse 9. I wrote to you in an epistle, mean, meaning the one that's lost. So this is evidence that there was Paul had apparently written a letter before 1 Corinthians to the church at Corinth. And he said this, not to company with fornicators. Now, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with the idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. Now, what he's saying here is, now, when I said don't, don't company with fornicators, I wasn't talking about with the world, I'm talking about with the church. Because, see, in the world, if you, if you don't company with fornicators and idolaters and so forth in the world or anywhere, you may as well go on to heaven because they're out there. <clears throat> then he goes on and clarifies it some more over here in verse 10. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man who is called a brother be a fornicator. This is the thing. And this is his point. That if there are people in the church claiming to be Christians and living in a, a lifestyle that is contrary to wholesome doctrine, and apparently sexual sins was, was, it was just as bad then as it is now. Been bad for a long time. All right? And um, Paul said, if a man calls himself a brother and is a fornicator, don't have... That's what he said. It gets even better. 
If any man that has called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, that means foul language, cusser. He cusses all the time. Talks like, like, cusses like a sailor. Or a drunkard, or an extortioner. And you've got to understand, this is not the only list. It's a limited list. Listen to what he says. With such a one, no not to eat. Don't even go out to eat with them. But we just fellowship. I'm loving on him. He said, don't even eat with them. Now, I know I just messed with 20th century and 21st century holy grail cows about walking in love. Yeah, somebody needs to turn clunk over. Clunk needs to take a nosedive. All right. Clunk just bit the dust. All right. <laughs> somebody just did some cow tipping back there. <laughs> he says, don't even go out and eat with them. See, fellowship, breaking bread together was a big thing in the church. It was a big deal. It was an important part of their social life was to break bread together. He says, if you've got somebody living in that lifestyle and they're called a brother, don't you eat with them. Don't hang with them. Lord, help me, Jesus. That's good preaching. All right. <laughs> Amen. See, we, see, if people just read their Bible, they stay out of trouble. They have, good, they have better doctrine. And stop reading for what you want and, and, and so forth. Listen, you, if you, like I said, if we just do systematic theology and don't read the other stuff, we miss stuff. I believe in systematic theology. I believe in studying the Bible that way. But I tell you, if we don't read, read it uh, in an expository or an exegetical manner, we're going we're gonna to mess up. You have to have both. Because if all you did was read scriptures on love and about the love of God and how God loves people and not read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you'd miss this whole thing. And you would get a skewed view of church discipline and how God deals with sinners. Christians who are in sin. Let's put it that way. Christians who are in sin. You begin to skew the view when Paul was very clear. Can you say he was very clear? Did he make it, do you think he made any ifs, ands, or buts about it right here? Anybody? No, he doesn't have ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's real clear. If, if you've got somebody in the church living in open sin, that's one thing. If somebody comes and says, Pastor, I, you know, I, I failed last week. Whatever it was, whatever it was. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working to get that straight in my life. And, I, and I'm making myself accountable to you. I'm repentant, you know, when they, and they, they're, they're dealing with it. That's not open sin. They're recognizing the error of their way. They, they want to be free. Okay? They want to get some things straight. But when they just come in with the mom and sit down in the church, or they, you know, they're, you know, of course, now the, one of the things we have to deal with is social medias. Watch what you put on social media. Everybody sees it. Amen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, sometimes our kids put stuff like that's really only if somebody was trying to read something that they made school, they say, take that down. Why? Well, somebody can look at that and think this. You know, and we, it's, it's, we can't afford it. Even we know we know what you meant. It can't be out there. We have, to, we have to guard it. We have to guard ourselves. We have to protect ourselves. Amen? I mean, watch what you like. Some things you like, and then you can find out that it's, it's, you know, if you watch the video, you think, oh, my God. You know? Be, be aware. But, but, you know, if you've got, when you've got people in the church who are just openly living in sin and don't care. Don't care. And they're going to come to church and act like it's okay. And the church acts like it's okay. Paul said it's not okay. All right? Now, he, remember, he judged him, turning over Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit be saved in the day of the Lord. Okay? Um, and then he, then he talks about that I wrote to you in the earlier epistle, which we believe was lost, not to accompany with fornicators. And he brings clarity, because apparently in that letter, he said not to accompany with fornicators, and they misunderstood it. And he had to clarify, say, no, if one that's called a brother is a fornicator or an idolater, and so forth and so on, have no company with him, don't even eat with him. Now, that's what he says here. What have I do to judge them that are without? So you can't go, you can't pass judgment on the sinners. They'll have to stand before God on that. 
In other words, if people are out there shooting people, whatever, now we have a court system, that kind of stuff. You, you can't turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh and all that. You can't, you can't bring that kind of judgment against them. But he does what he does say. Do not ye judge them that are within. Now, so, so obviously when Jesus said in Matthew 7, 1, judge not lest you be judged, and Paul says we're supposed to judge them that are within, there, there's, not a, there's really not a conflict there. You just have to read them in context and understand what they're talking about. When Jesus said it, he's talking about hypocritical judgment. Because he says, you know, and then listen, not everybody who, who says you're fornicating and that's wrong has the beam in their eye that they're fornicating too. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Jesus is in reference to a hypocritical judgment. Yeah. I'm judging you for sinning and I'm doing it and I'm doing it bigger. That's hypocritical. Listen to what Jesus said when he says that, though. Study it. He went on and said, first remove the beam out of your eye, yeah, yeah. and then you can see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye. Yeah. So he said, in other words, get rid of your hypocritical thing, and then you can judge him for what he's doing. Judge not lest you be judged. In other words, with the judgment you use, you're going to receive it back. If you're clean, then you can make that judgment. And not be hypocritical. Because Paul says right here that the church is supposed to judge those that are within. So th there's, there's not a conflict in the Bible. We just have to read things in context and understand it. If we come out of that light surfacey thing and grab something, like I said earlier, and using that as an insulatory type statement where I can't ever be judged because Jesus said judge not lest you be judged. And I'm just, you know, I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. And if you say anything about it, you're being judgmental. Well, Paul said, if you come into church and do whatever you want to do, that you're supposed to be turned, you know, we're, we're going to judge you, and we're not going to eat with you, and we're not going to fellowship with you. Hello? Yeah. He says, and, um, for what have I to do with the judge? Them also that are without, do we not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judges, therefore put away from there. Listen to me. He gives his final statement about the guy who's living with his daddy's wife. Therefore put that wicked person away from you. Put him out. Now listen. He's not counting it as an enemy. Okay? As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians, he says to receive such one back into the fellowship, lest he be overcome with much sorrow. Yeah. He repented. That's what's wrong with the church. There's no church discipline. And if... Jeff gets judged by the church for living in sin and put out. What we have in our church system now is they just run down the road to another church and go in there and talk about how Pastor Ed was so mean and didn't walk in love. And they go, yeah, we want your tithe. Come on in. And we don't, they don't give a rip what you were doing over at Pastor Ed's church. And if I tell them, hello, they don't call you in and go, you left that church in sin, and you're not coming over here until it gets dealt with over there. Nobody does that. Nobody has the gumption to do that anymore. A bunch of weenies running the church. Are y'all here? You're going home. That's just the truth. And it's time that the church, you know, listen. I, now, listen, I remember a day when the denominations, if somebody left one denominational church and they went to another and they wanted to transfer their membership and the pastor called up and said, hey, they're over here. They caused me all kinds of problems and stuff over here. They would say, and I'm not sending them a letter of transfer. They couldn't transfer their membership. See? Not a lot of people joined, like, the, the denomination I was in. If you left and went to a different church somewhere, you would, you would send a letter to the church you left to the other one asked for a transfer of membership. And they would send a letter transferring your membership to that new church. But I'm telling you, there was a time when the church would say, they, left, they, they were running around with somebody in the church. And they were in the church discipline and left. And that pastor, you're not coming here. Because you are going to have to go back and be under the re repentance and authority of that church. I had a group show up one time, about 30 people. All on the same thing. We were, we were Church of the Week. And, you know, that newspaper, the Church of the Week, which was, it was free. It, was just, it wasn't you were the Church of the Week. You were just the one that got your name in the queue. Yeah. You know, that's how it worked. You know, Church of the Week. And we got them all lined up for the rest of the year. You know, you're not like, it wasn't like an honor. You didn't get a badge. You're the Church of the Week. Well, the day after we were the Church of the Week, on Saturday, we had 30 people show up on Sunday. 
They're all going out the door. How you doing? Well, where are you from? And they're all from the same church. Yeah. Now, I'm not, you know, I don't have a Ph.D. in microbiology, okay, or, or dynamic physics or something, but I'm not stupid either. Something's going on at that church, all right? I mean, something's happening over there, and it ain't good. So I called the pastor up. I said, I said Pastor, I'm, I'm Ed Taylor of Faith and Victory Church. Now, brother, I just had 30 people from your church show up in my church this Sunday. Well, to be honest with you, there's, there's a problem going on. Yet you think? You think? So I, I um, talked to him, and finally he told me who the ringleader was and, and so forth. And so I... I said, well, listen, I, I'll, I'll stop the bleeding. Now, he said, he said, now, be honest with you, I don't even want them back. Yeah, yeah. She, okay. So I went and got the ringleader the next time they came to church, pulled her off the side. I said, let me tell you something. We're not here to hurt that church. We're, we're, we're the body of Christ. Don't you tell another person where y'all are going to church. I said, number two, you're going to go back over to that pastor and you're going to get this straight before you come here. Yep. You're going to go repent and you're going to get this straight before you come over here. I better not see another person from that church show up at my church. Because we're not here to hurt them. We're not trying to put them out of business. Now, here's, here's, here's what you can do. If you're ministers, pastors, pastors especially, they'll leave the way they came. And they did. The whole bunch left together. And you knew, you knew eventually it was going to happen. You know? But, you know, we said we st no more. Don't, don't. I, we had no church. They, they kind of, the, the assistant pastor had started dividing the church up. And uh, they all showed up over here, about, about 40 showed up over here. Well, we could, if we just didn't, wouldn't have integrity, we could just keep people coming. So I called the pastor. He said, he said my church was torn up. He said, I, I tried to offer them, you know, let's, let's don't do this. Let's, let's plan another church over in High Point, and we'll give, you, you know, we'll give you 25 families. Church was about 700. God didn't want that. He wanted, he wanted his, his fair share. He wouldn't do it. So those people came in here, and I just stood in the pulpit because I went and talked to the pastor. I said, now look, you may come here for a little while, but our, our, our goal is to reconnect you with the church you're coming out of. It's not to have you here. Not two more weeks, that guy started the church, and they all went with him. <laughs> About six years later, he got caught with a phone bill that came to the church with, loaded with 1-900 numbers. He had a private line in his office. They were all following him around. He's great. He's awesome. He's preaching like all this, this, the blah, 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 blah. Phone bill. Secretary got it, opened it up, thinking it was a regular church phone bill, not knowing it was the private, the pastor's private secret line. And all that was on it was 900 numbers. Way well, back in that era, 900 numbers were porn lines. He was just living on porn on the phone. I guess if he had good high-speed connection. And this is, this is a number of years, about 15 years ago, so it wasn't, as much internet access as there is now. And so he had in his office, he just sit there on, on sex talk on, on, in the church office. Woo! He wouldn't even come back to the church. He just disappeared. Just disappeared. Toward a church, the church went down to less than 100 with a million dollar building. He couldn't hardly get rid of the thing. There's a mess. See, there's no discipline in the church anymore. All the independent churches. See, we, we've all gotten all charismatic independent churches and nobody's under anybody's authority. And if somebody exercises authority, they rebel against it and go out and do their own thing. Well, I'm not listening. Remember, now, Lord, there was a well, well, well known I just don't want to, I mean, it was public. If I called his name, I wouldn't be gossiping because it was a public issue. And it was handled publicly because of the way it was done. There's a well, well, well-known uh, Assemblies of God minister. Big television ministry. Got in sin with Playboy and picking up girls and all this kind of stuff. And got exposed. Now, 
the local conference of the, of the church where he was. So he had a church, but he had a television ministry and traveled. Okay? The local conference had so much revenue coming in from the television ministry tithe that they just, they just gave him a slap on the wrist. Springfield came in and said, no way, he's out for two years. He's going into church discipline and repentance. This has been public. He's going to repent public, and he's going to serve his, his, his period of time of restoration. Getting, and listen, you understand this. That, that this there's two, two sides of that. One is you're, you're not going to continue ministering. Two is we're going to work with you and help restore you, but it's going to be done in private without you going, continuing to carry on. And, and, and they said, nope, and cut off ties with, the, with the, or, the, the domination and went out on his own and continued and about six months later or nine months later, got caught in the hotel room with a, with a prostitute. And people still kept watching him. See, we, we won't submit to authority anymore. Won't submit to, to correction anymore. And they resisted Paul. It's nothing new. We, we find out um, that they resisted Paul. It didn't go well. This didn't go well. Y'all here, you go home. There has to be a respect for the correction, of, for the corrective authority of the church that is not in the church anymore. Because what happens is they don't respect the pastors. If you try to say something, they cut you off and they just leave and go somewhere else. And there's no, there's, no, there's no authority to stop them. Hello? Now, I'm not talking about people leave, just leaving a church. But when they're, when they're not living right, when they're, when they're not living godly, when their attitudes stink worse than a skunk, dead skunk in the middle of the road, and that's pretty ding-dang-dong bad. If you ever lived in Tulsa, you got to know it. Uh, 71st Street was Skunk Alley. I would drive from Copper Mill Apartments down Sheridan Hill. And once we got back then, uh, once you passed the mall and the football stadium for the high school, uh, it went to two lanes. And down that two-lane road where they just poured asphalt on top of a dirt road, I think. There was always, every morning, a dead skunk. Maybe two. You'd drive by and you could just come in your car. <laughs> Jeff. He done messed me up again. <laughs> I mean, you know, back then we were Javon Musk oil. We got to school, it was skunk oil. Y'all remember musk oil? Anybody remember musk oil? Why did we like musk oil? You know? Yeah, rugged is right. How did I get on dead skunks? You're trying to figure out, Archie Bill. How can we get him back? Come back, come back. Yep. And so we, we, get, we don't have any church discipline. And here Paul, and now, now everybody just runs around and says, you've got to walk in love, you've got to love people no matter what they do. And what people don't understand is what Paul did was love. His concern for the church and for the individual is exhibited. One, you can't leave that leaven in the church or it will affect the whole church. Number two, he's going to go to hell if he doesn't get straightened out. And so I'm going to bring a correction to him that's going to cause him to want to repent so that he doesn't go to hell. That's love. People won't accept that as love now because what they mean as love is you've got to accept what I'm doing. And it's, so, like, you tell a homosexual that living in homosexuality is a sin. You're a hate monger. You're homophobic. I'm not scared of you. I'm just not scared of you. Okay? I'm not afraid of you. So homophobic doesn't work. It's a fear of something. And actually, pho phobias are an unreasonable fear of something. In other words, you're scared of heights. You're standing on a concrete slab. You know, you're, you're, although you're 70 stories up, there's no way you're going to fall off. There's a rail there, but you're afraid of that because you have an unreasonable fear of that height. A phobia is an unreasonable fear, not just a basic fear of something. Just because you're afraid of snakes doesn't mean you have a phobia of snakes. Yeah. It means I'm trained to kill them on sight. Amen. <laughs> kill first. 
find out if Jack is your friend of Jack. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Or he's going to kill a fella. Yeah. Red next to black. Was it yellow next to black or red next to black? Is it black. friend of Jack? Red next to yellow will kill a fella. All right? That, I ain't, I'm not going to find out. If I see red and yellow, he's dead. Yeah. We'll find out what order it was in later. Sorry, pal. <laughs> Maybe you can come back at something else in the next way. You know. No, we don't believe in that either. Hallelujah. I do believe in reincarnation. I heard T.L. Osborne say that on the 700 Club one time. You know, the, uh, Pat was going and talking about reincarnation, and, and, and T.L. Osborne loses there and says, I believe in reincarnation. And he just threw Pat Robinson all off. <laughs> Messed him up. You do? Yes. That's the gospel. Jesus Christ being reincarnated in us. We're becoming new creatures in Christ. <laughs> Oh, totally messed him up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Praise God. But see, the, the, Paul here, because of what's going on in the church at Corinth, brings a stinging rebuke, not just to the person who was doing it, but to the church that wasn't dealing with it. God doesn't do that. Why don't you go check out Annie and Sari? Ananias and Sapphira, who fell dead in the church for just lying to the Holy Ghost. They won't even fornicate. They just lied to the Holy Ghost. You've not lied to me, you lied to the Holy Ghost. Boom. Little leaven leavens the whole hump, bringing deception into the church. The root of deception is from the deceiver. You can't have that running around the church. Wife shows up a little bit later, said, tell me, did you sell your land for so much? Yeah. Well, why you had it? You could have sold it for whatever price, and you could have brought whatever. You just told her, said, you know what, I sold it for 5000 but I'm, I'm going to get 2500 of the church, and that would have been okay. But you just seized. So the men that just buried your husband are here now to pick you up and take you out and bury you. Boom. They didn't have this mushy-gushy time. They're going, now listen, we understand. We love you. And we know you were just misguided. And we're not going to judge you about this. We're just going to let you continue to let everybody think that you gave so much to the church. That's not what they did. That wasn't, the, that wasn't what the Holy Ghost did. That wasn't the instruction by the Spirit. That's not what Paul did in Corneth. Now, we don't count them as enemies, but they are to be shunned. Paul writes out another place says, you know, don't count them as an enemy. But at the same time, you can't have fellowship with them. They're to be shamed for how they're living. And listen, this has to be the whole church. It just can't be one church does it and the next church takes them in and lets them get away with it over there. I, I was, I, we had a friend who was, who was the manager at the old O'Brien. When O'Brien's was still down in the old western uh, Sizzling Steakhouse down on High Point Road. Before they moved to the other one, they, they finally went out of business. Okay. We used to eat there a lot. And we knew the manager real good. And, you know, they had a guy stealing liquor. Caught him. Stealing, and that's expensive. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, there's all, those, all those alcohol beverages are very expensive. Because part of it's for the taxes, the, from the ABC taxes and that kind of stuff. It's just expensive. He was stealing it. He was actually taking that and taking cases of that and selling it somewhere else. They caught him. Fired him, obviously. Decided not to press charges. That was not necessarily a good idea. Another restaurant down the road called and said, did so-and-so used to work for you guys? Yeah, we caught him stealing liquor. They went, a guy went in there a couple weeks later, and that guy's working. Now, you know you got a thief in your midst. Hello? We like somebody coming in here, and, you know, and, and, and uh, another pastor called and said, I mean, somebody comes to our church, and they tell me, well, I went over to, I went over to this church down the road, and, uh, but I decided to leave. Okay, all right. I called the pastor. He said, look, he was one of our ushers. And we caught him stealing money out of the offering place. And the next time he comes to my church, he's my head usher taking up the offering. You know what I say about that? If you're going to be dumb, you have to be tough. Because if he's stealing down there, he's going to be stealing over here. You know? He was stealing. You know, if, if Pastor also tells me that someone just showed up at my church was stealing money out of their offering plates, number one, I'm going to tell him, you probably need to go find a church. <coughs> Excuse me. You need to go back to your church and get that straight. You owe them some money. 
I don't know how much you stole. You need to find out what it is and give it back to them. And then you need to repent before God, repent before the pastor. And then you, you know, and then if he says, look, it's probably better, you know, now that all this taken care of, I think you need to clean start going down the pastor. You're not going to be my head usher. You ain't going to be an usher. You're not going to be anywhere near Donatos. Green Donatos, yellow Donatos, little stripy Donatos with gold in them, I don't, whatever kind of Donatos, you ain't going to be near them. Because I'm going to, because this church was now going to carry out the t discipline of watching your life be restored and governed and not just go, oh, we love you, come on in, just do whatever. Hello? I was a youth pastor or such, I call him up. Yeah, we had to, we had to uh, let it go. We didn't have enough evidence with the police, but we, we, we had found out, uh, pretty, pretty sure he was sleeping with the teenage girls in the department. You ain't getting near our youth. Hello? Amen? So we, we've got to get back to that kind of point. And Paul exercised that. See, there were people in that church who were against Paul. And, and mimic, and, and actually mocked, mocked, not mimic, mocked his apostolic authority. And when we get further into the letter, we'll find out he gives a defense of his authority as an apostle. To combat that very thing going on in the church. They, he even talks about one place in, in the New Testament, and I'm not, we haven't gotten that far down the road yet. But he talks about, you know, you think I'm small in, in, in person, but he, he speaks bold in his letters, but he, his stature is not real big. See, it doesn't matter. He carried authority by the Holy Ghost. Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. John Joy, chapter 5. I'm gonna say, we have, these are the things... If we understand this, then when we hear scriptures on walking in love, they can be tempered against there is a place of authority and discipline in the church. And we just don't go mushy-gushy, sloppy agape on someone living in open sin. It's not going to help them. As a matter of fact, condoning what they're doing, well, I'm not condoning, I'm not judging them. You're condoning. I can't say it's wrong because it's not for me to say. The Bible's already said it. It's not, it is, you don't have to say, the Bible says this. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to be there for them. The Bible told you not to be there for them. It told you not to hang out with them. You're going to pray for them, and you're going to trust God to deal with them, and they're, they're going to be in the church discipline until they repent and become shamed for what they're doing. Your being there for them only helps reinforce them doing it. You're an enabler. Amen? You're complicit in their sin. We have laws against complicity. Complicity. That word. In crime. Being complicit in a crime, there's laws against that. In the natural. We get into the church and people are sinning against God's law and we, we can be complicit. We just, we can't. It's not right for me to say anything. You don't love them. You really don't love them. You're willing to let them take the chance of going to hell rather than, than to challenge their actions according to the word. Not just their opinion, according to the word. That one never all big tonight. I'm just, but I, thought, I, I thought I saw four people run by me so fast they were excited. Anybody get that excited? What's that, Cap? Oh. It means you didn't actually commit it, a crime, but you were condoning or uh, did not address it as a crime. Similar to accomplice, you know. Well, accomplice cares, cares to mean you actually helped. Compli being complicit means you had knowledge of it, you didn't address it, you let it go, and didn't deal with it in any way. You just were an observer like Paul was holding the coats of the people who stoned Stephen. They stoned Stephen. Paul didn't help them, but he held their coats. He was complicit in the death of Stephen.